Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to News Dose. And Xbox just signed an agreement that not only repairs a relationship, but it also gives them a new partnership that will include new games for their platforms and maybe even including Game Pass. Then on top of that, this deal could actually also speak to their future plans as well. Yeah, this is all going a little bit under the radar right now, but we will get into its significance today. Then also Nintendo is a part of the latest controversy and that all digital future really feels like 2024 has lit up this discussion and that concern rages on now that a certain Nintendo DLC is no longer accessible despite Nintendo's claim that this would not be an issue. So do stay tuned for all of that, but... Let's just go and jump right into things, starting off with an update for Dead Space 2. We talked about this yesterday, but if you missed that video, to put it short, there's been a lot of back and forth about whether or not EA canceled a Dead Space 2 remake. And, well, according to Jason Schreier from Bloomberg, there is some truth to these rumors. We can take a look here at his tweet, which summarizes the situation. He said, yes, Dead Space is now on ice once again. EA Motive explored ideas for a new entry early last year, but none were greenlit. Chief hope was for a new game, not a remake of Dead Space 2, despite today's rumors, although both ideas were explored. So, to Jeff Grubb's credit, this does back up his claim that EA Motive was working on a Dead Space 2 concept and that it was cancelled. As we talked about yesterday, EA dismissed that report, but now here we are once again, and it does appear that that rumor was indeed accurate. But I will say that this newest Jason Schreier report did reveal something very interesting, and that was the idea that EA Motive's Dead Space 2 was not going to be a remake. It was apparently being planned, or at least they were hoping for it to be a completely new game. Maybe they could have made Dead Space 2 a little bit more scary than that original title, and then they could have ultimately secured a better overall future for the eventual Dead Space 3, which, you know, the original just completely went off the rails. Now, I know a lot of us wanted a remake of the second game, because that one was actually really good, but honestly, I mean... A new direction might have actually ended up being better. It's kind of honestly exciting to think about, or really depressing maybe even to a degree, that we almost got a brand new mainline Dead Space game for the first time since 2013. Almost really is the key word there, because unfortunately, last year's Dead Space remake apparently didn't meet EA's expectations. And, I mean, who knows if EA had realistic expectations. Uh, but ultimately, they've now decided to go in a new direction. For us Dead Space fans, I'd say that it's a very tough day. Now, for those out there who are enjoying the new Fallout Amazon series, though, we got a very exciting update today for Fallout 4 as well. This is to coincide with the show and... Really, this is just a brilliant move. We've already seen this happen for a few different games. These video game adaptations, when done well, does translate to more success for a given game. The Last of Us, The Witcher 3, and Cyberpunk 2077 are three such examples. They all saw a resurgence with successful shows. And I'm sure that Xbox and Bethesda are hoping the same thing will happen with Fallout 4. That's exactly why a new update will release on April 25th. You can see here that this free update includes native applications for PS5 and the Xbox Series X and S. Performance mode and quality mode settings will be included as well as stability improvements and fixes. Experience up to 60 frames per second and increased resolutions. Fallout 4 players on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One will also receive a free update with stability improvements, login, and quest fixes. Now, over on PC, you will also get widescreen support, and I mean, this is a huge update for a very popular game. The fact that this is free, I'd say is pretty incredible, and I mean, I might have to jump back in myself. Now, as far as the show is concerned, I've not watched it yet myself, so I can't really give my personal opinion on it. Uh, but if you are interested, it is reviewing very well. It has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, and its audience score sits at a comfortable 84%. So if that holds true, which, you know, that's the question here, but if it does, then this is more or less one of the best video game adaptations ever made. If anything else, I feel like we're finally at that point when game adaptations can actually be taken seriously. Uh, they're not just automatically bad like they used to be. Now, speaking of Xbox franchises, though, which is kind of hard to believe, yes, Fallout is now owned by Xbox, uh, but let's go and talk about them. So prior to the Activision Blizzard acquisition, there was a big dispute between Activision and NetEase, which resulted in their contract 
not being renewed. Now, little does some people know, this was actually a significant story because what this means is that games like World of Warcraft was pulled from China. And that is actually massive because that is one of Blizzard's biggest reasons with games like World of Warcraft. I mean, we're talking about a significant amount of players that were just suddenly gone because they couldn't reach an agreement. So that was a ginormous blow to both Chinese players and to the World of Warcraft IP itself. Well, the good news here is that's now officially a thing of the past. Microsoft and NetEase just reached a new agreement which could be beneficial to players worldwide, including the Xbox fan base as well. More on that here in just a second. But first, we can take a look here at Phil Spencer's response, which reads, Thanks to the incredible work done by Blizzard Entertainment and NetEase to renew our commitment to players, we will soon welcome back millions of community members in China to our Blizzard universes. This is exciting for everyone at Xbox, Blizzard, and for players everywhere. Now, okay, you might be wondering how exactly does this benefit Xbox players specifically, and well, the answer to that question is actually over on Blizzard's website, where it said, separately, Microsoft Gaming and NetEase have also entered into an agreement to explore bringing new NetEase titles to Xbox consoles and other platforms. So, there you go. This really is a win for everybody involved, and for that matter, now that Xbox owns Activision Blizzard, you know, there is actually a very real chance that World of Warcraft will eventually get an Xbox port later down the line. Now, that might be a long ways away, but it is important that World of Warcraft is as healthy as possible so it can last for years and years to come, and this is a major move in ensuring its future success. Now, as for NetEase on Xbox, though, NetEase is a huge game company, and while they're mostly known for their mobile expertise, they have made a lot of sizable investments towards AAA gaming as well. The upcoming Marvel Rivals, as one such example, is their game. A lot of people are very excited about Marvel Rivals. Then back in 2022, they established Nagoshi Studio, which is headed up by the Yakuza creator, Tashihiro Nagoshi. Back then, they said that their goal was to make high-quality console games, and here we are. Xbox could actually end up being a home for whatever his next game is, and... I mean, if it's anywhere as close to the same quality as the Yakuza series, we could get something very special. NetEase also just established Bullet Farm earlier this year, which is another AAA studio that's led by the former Call of Duty Black Ops lead. And then back in 2022, they formed Jar of Sparks, which is led by the former Halo Infinite lead design. So by all means, NetEase is not just a simple mobile company. They've been making some rather big investments for big AAA games as well. And Xbox is all but ensuring that those games will be on their platforms in the future. Now with that said though, the mobile side of things is still important to this partnership as well. In the past, NetEase was a big partner to Blizzard on games like Diablo Immortal. And with Xbox's aspirations for their mobile storefront, I imagine this will be a rather critical partnership to ensure their success in the future. With the support of NetEase, not only will they likely get a lot of mobile games immediately for their storefront, but something else that they could do is that they could license out IPs such as Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Halo, Doom, Gears, Fallout, The Elder Scrolls, and the list just goes on and on and on. Like I said, this is actually a significant partnership for multiple, multiple reasons. I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about this online, but I think gamers will be much more aware in the future once NetEase starts to announce games for Xbox consoles, their mobile storefront, and who knows, maybe even for Game Pass as well. Moving on though, let's go and talk about Nintendo and that digital only future. So sadly, Nintendo ended online support for the 3DS and the Wii U earlier this week, and okay, we've known that this was gonna happen for quite some time. But the thing about this situation was that Nintendo reassured fans that despite the lack of online, and you know, the stores are long gone by this point, but any digital content that you purchased, you'll be able to re-download those no problem. The only thing is, there is a problem. This was posted up over on Reddit, and let's just take a look at what's happening. So they said previously purchased Smash Bros. 3DS DLC is no longer re-downloadable. Access to games DLC is managed on a per-game basis, so if you delete DLC, you have to go back through the game itself to re-download DLC. You can't do it in the eShop itself. I just tested this with Mighty Gun Vault's DLC to verify this. Smash Bros. does this a little differently. It makes you connect to its online servers before you connect to the eShop. And because Nintendo just shut down 
Smashdown Online services for the 3DS and Wii U tonight, you can't connect to Smash Online, effectively meaning that all DLC that you previously purchased is no longer available. Only for the 3DS version, I can't speak for the Wii U. Now, from what I've seen in the comments, and I can't confirm this myself, but the Wii U does not have the same issue because it deals with DLC differently. Let me know in the comments below if you can confirm or deny this report. But right now, it does appear that this problem is exclusive for the 3DS version. But you know, this is a very popular game on the 3DS. Honestly, that's actually how I played this game. I chose the 3DS version over the Wii U. I still have my physical copy on my shelf right now. And the fact that the 3DS is just a more popular device than the Wii U, I, I imagine a lot of people chose this version. So this is a terrible look for Nintendo. Now to be fair here, maybe Nintendo just simply overlooked this problem because its DLC is handled differently. And if that is the case, maybe Nintendo will come out and fix this with some kind of future update. I'd like to think that's what will happen, uh, but that's really just ultimately one of the major concerns that a lot of people have when it comes to that digital-only future. We really just have to trust these companies. We don't have control of our digital libraries the same way that we do physical media. And that's been highlighted a few different times in just the past six months. Last year, there was that big dispute between Sony and Discovery, and... They almost took purchase content away from PlayStation customers that bought that content. That is insane to think about. And now we have Nintendo here in this entire Smash Brothers situation. I mean, meanwhile, we've had regulators cry over the Activision Blizzard buyout for the past two years, but here we have an actual problem where it would be nice if these regulators would step in. This digital-only future is a major concern, and it does need to be better regulated to reassure fans that they have better control of their content for the long term. Again, though, let's just kind of hope Nintendo steps up and actually fixes this issue, but it would also be nice if regulators would step up as well, because this really shouldn't be an issue in the first place. Now, one last thing before we go. Speaking of digital games, obviously, subscription services are a part of that future. And EA just announced a price hike for their subscription EA Play. Next month, it'll go from $5 a month to $6. The yearly fee will then be $40 instead of its usual $30. Now, if you're a pro subscriber, its yearly price is also set to raise to $120, up from the previous $100. The monthly price will now be $17, up from the previous $15. So, all in all, this looks to be an incremental raise, which is pretty standard for these subscription services as a whole. Last year, both Xbox and PlayStation raised their subscription prices, with Sony dramatically raising theirs. That was not an incremental change at all. But this really just kind of follows what we've been seeing from the movie industry as well. It's become a common practice over the years to slowly raise price, and I mean, I guess if anything, while these don't seem to be big increases at first, it does make a difference in the long run, especially when you see multiple increases over an extended period of time. I mean, we'll see if gaming follows suit with that as well, uh, but, you know, it's ultimately just going to come down to the consumers. You know, does the content justify this price tag? And if it does, consumers are going to subscribe, and if it doesn't, you know, people are going to bell, and, you know, that's really just going to be up to you. So let me know what you think about all of that in the comments below. Do you think EA Play's new price tag is justified or not? Anyways, though, that's going to be it for this episode. I'll be back tomorrow, so do make sure to subscribe. But until then, peace out.